Everybody doing okay? Good, good. Has the chaos of the season got you yet? Just a few of us, huh? The rest of you. Easy breezy. All right. Well, hey, it's great to have you all here with us today. Um, I'm Dave. I am uh, an associate pastor here at the bridge. Pastor Mark uh, is, uh, thanks. Um, he is over at Kings River today. Um, today is the last day of services for Kings River. Um, most of you all know um, that they are going to join us and become a part of the bridge uh, starting uh, officially after, right after the first Sunday of the year. Uh, and so th this is their last service. Yeah, yeah, we're excited about that. Um, but today it's probably gonna be a little bit challenging for some of them. Um, God has moved in their lives uh, over the last several years there at Kings River, and, and today will, I, I feel sure will be a bittersweet time. Um, uh, if, if we were joining another church and today was our last service, probably it would be some excitement about God's doing something new and, and some sadness at the same time. Uh, and uh, we want to remember them today. Uh, as, they, as they have their last services. So Pastor Mark is over there uh, doing ministry with them uh, and, and uh, start beginning the transition of them becoming a part of us. So um, as, we, as we launch out this morning, we wanna just have a little bit of time of prayer. Uh, particularly, we're gonna remember Kings River um, uh, while we pray this morning. So if you would, please bow your heads uh, and let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful for your love. I thank you so much for uh, your ministry I thank you for the ministry that you have done in our community and in the lives of, of many, many people through, through Kings River. And today, Father, as they, as they wrap up meeting together as a congregation there, I, I pray that, that you would, would just minister. Father, I pray that you would fill them with joy, the joy that comes from knowing who you are and recognizing your movement in their lives. Father, I pray that you would give them peace today. I'm sure for a number of them, this is going to be a, a bittersweet time, but I pray that you would fill them with peace, knowing that it is not Kings River, it is not just Pastor Curtis or, or any individual that has done ministry to them, but it has been you. And Father, I pray that you give them peace as they, as they come and become a part of us, that they would know that you are our God as well, and that it is you who does ministry here and not just Pastor Mark or, or any other individual. Um, you are the one who does all good things. And so, Father, we pray that you bless them today. Bless them as they make this transition and be with them. Father, as we go into our services today and as we take time to think about Christmas and to, to look into the scriptures, I, I pray, Father, that your spirit would be very present among us, and we pray that with confidence because you have promised it, that it is true that your spirit is among us, because we are gathered here in your name. And, and you tell us that where two or more are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst. And so, Father, we pray that your spirit would move in a way among us, in our hearts, in our minds, to draw us to you, to fix our focus of all things on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. Father, speak to us now. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is, it, I love Christmas, uh, um, I, and I love Christmas not necessarily for all the things that we typically think about Christmas. Uh, um, I'm not a huge big on the hoopla of Christmas, uh, but I love Christmas because of what, what it reminds me of and how important it is to our faith. Um, real quickly, because I forgot this in the last service. Uh, how many of y'all are planning on coming to the Christmas Eve experience this, this year? All right. Awesome. Um, hey, can, can I give you a word of encouragement about it? We have uh, five services, the three morning ones, and then we've got two in the afternoon, I think 4.30 and 6. I don't have my reading glasses, so I can't tell you what the back of this card says. You can get these at the desk out just outside the lobby there, so you can invite friends. Um, but uh, what we would love, if it is possible, we want to encourage as many people to come to the morning services as possible. I think a lot of people are going, oh, it's Christmas Eve, we should go in the evening. Um, here's the reality. Look around this room. 
This is how much space we have Christmas Eve as well. <laughs> if five services of people go, I want to go to the, either the 4.30 or the 6, guess what's going to happen? It's going to be ugly. <laughs> people are going to have other people questioning their faith and all kinds of things. So, so if, you can, if you can come to the morning, please do. Uh, that would be great. That way we can keep some space open to, to people who aren't a part of our church that, that uh, maybe God wants to move in their life and draw them into to this body of believers uh, for the last ones. So if you can, please do. If you can't, okay. We'll figure it out, all right? Okay. I think that's the only big announcement I was supposed to make. And I forgot it last time, but it's the first service. They'll come to the first service anyway, so. I'm kidding. All right, Christmas. And uh, we've been going through this series, Christmas Here and Now. Does it even matter anymore? Um, and, and Pastor Mark, over the last couple of weeks, has covered uh, love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That Christmas reminds us of the love of God. It, it shows us that promise of his love fulfilled. And, and, and we see it in the person of Jesus Christ who came, the only begotten of God, to live and to die for us. Last week, Pastor Mark talked about joy and how we find joy because of the coming of Christ. Today, we're gonna be talking about peace. And uh, uh, I, I don't know about y'all, but, but peace is one of those, for me, one of those really odd things to, to nail down and to, to grasp and to hold on to. Does anybody here tr have trouble holding on to peace? Besides me, okay, seven of us. <laughs> nice. Um, the rest of y'all go ahead and take your nap. It'll be all right. Um, uh, peace is, is, is a challenge to me. There's a lot of ways that I feel peace and, and, and there's a lot of people who know me because I'm fairly low key that would go, oh, except when I'm up here, I'm pretty low key. Um, uh, that we go, oh man, peace, like, that's, that's Dave. That, that, uh, and there's ways that it feels like that, but, but a lot of times the inside doesn't feel like that. Uh, this week, so I was, I was uh, getting ready to, to start working on this sermon. I've been thinking about it for a while because Pastor Mark told me I was going to be speaking a, a while ago. And so, so I'd been thinking on it and praying about it, but, but Monday got here and it's like, okay, ready to really dig in and, and get this sermon together, right? Here we go, uh, and I come into church, and one of the things that I do regularly uh, is I walk the parking lot. Um, I'm terrible at a desk, and so, so I go in, I sit down, and I do some stuff at the desk, and then I get up, and I go, and I walk, and I pray, and uh, I, I just spend some time with God going, okay, God, help to clarify my thoughts and pull it together, uh, and, and so I was out walking the parking lot, and, and, and Amy came out of the building and said, something just happened, the internet, the phones, everything's gone, everything's down. Nothing. They were working on the parking lot over here, and I think when they took a tree down, maybe like the roots or something popped the uh, whatever kind of line <laughs> it is. I was like, oh, good. That means no one can interrupt me. <laughs> oh, I can't get on the internet. That's going to cost me. And so I did what all good pastors do. I went to Starbucks because everything works at Starbucks for a fee. And uh, I got online and I was sitting there and I was studying and, and, and doing some research online. And uh, the Starbucks right down here is not huge. And, and I was sitting at, on, on the bench at a little table and two women came in almost right after I got sat down and got started and sat down right next to me because it was a pretty full house. And they started talking, and one of the ladies was telling the other one about her day. And she was, I think she had two children, as, as best my eavesdropping could, and I wasn't really, I wasn't really trying, but you've been to Starbucks, right? It's like, you can't help but listen to the, this seems a little private for Starbucks, you know? Um, anyway, uh, so I think she had a couple of kids, and, and she was talking about, oh man, they go to school in Palmetto, and so, so, 
this morning started out with them wanting me to drive them to school, and I was like, I can't drive you to school because I've got to drive you to school, and then, and then I've got to come back into Bradenton, and I've got to do this, 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 and this, and then I'll have to come back over the, to Palmetto to get you from school, and then bring you back home, and then we'll be at home for just a little bit, and I've got this, 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 and this, and I've got to get done while you're at home, and then I've got to take one back over for, for church at this time, and then I've got to take one back over at this time, and, and I cannot do all it. And I was going... I don't miss having kids that age. <laughs> Thank you, God, for peace. No. Um, anybody here ever feel like your life is like that, ladies, that, that the list of what you have to do and, and all of the pressures and all of the things that are, are kind of pulling on you and tugging on you and that you need to do and everybody's dependent? Anybody here? <sighs> I can't. And I'm trying to work on a sermon going, I feel bad for you, but could you go talk somewhere else? I've got important stuff to do. Then uh, one evening this week, I had a friend that called me that was wanting to talk. And, and, and as she talked, she, she was saying that, that she thinks in pictures. And, and the picture that just she cannot get out of her head is a picture of, of a, a hamster wheel. And she said, she cannot get it to stop. Outside, it looks peaceful, but inside, the hamster wheel is going 100 miles an hour, and she cannot get her insides to come to calm. Anybody here got a hamster wheel that on the outside, you look like a duck on a pond? But underneath, those feet are going to town, right? <laughs> Chaos. As I was thinking about that and talking with her, uh, I recognized, man, that, that's how I feel a lot of the time. And Christmas, Christmas is a really odd thing because we talk about these great themes, love. And then we get in fights at the mall <laughs> over parking spots. And we get in fights with our kids because of getting in line for Santa Claus. <laughs> and those people up there just cut in line. I'm so glad for the love. <laughs> right? Joy. That it's going to be over soon. <laughs> right? Peace. But I've got a billion things to get done. As I was thinking about all of those things, one of the things that I recognize as well is a lot of times in my relationship with Christ, I feel chaos and a hamster wheel. Because I don't know about you all, but somewhere in me is a legalist. Somewhere in me is a performance-based person who wants to earn the love of God. Even though I've been a believer for, for 45 years or so, there's still some part of me that gets it flipped and I go back to religion. Anybody here ever feel like your relationship with Christ doesn't have a lot of peace because somehow you've twisted it back to where it's dependent on you? Even though you know that it's not. You go back. And today we're talking about the birth of Christ. Christ. And does it even matter anymore? Well, as I was thinking through all of these things, I started praying and going, God, show me how I try to find peace and show me how we, as people, often go looking for peace. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the things that struck me was, was a couple of things jump out at me. One is I become a pleaser to anyone and everyone around me. Because if I can make everyone around me happy, guess what I will have? Peace. So I will do anything anyone wants for a bit. Usually it's by gritting my teeth. And it has a promise of peace, but it never really delivers. Because the more you... You give when you're just 
doing it from, the, from a place of inside yourself, I, I think you just run dry. Has anybody been there? And then the lack of peace that you feel is so much worse. So then I swing to the other side, because most of us, if we're a pendulum, we swing really far. <laughs> and I go to being a pleaser. Oh, what does anybody need? I'll do it. To I'll be in control. Any control freaks? I know how to find peace. That's by being in charge. And boy, it's going to be my way, right? Maybe you do that with your family. Nope. It's, I said, <laughs> and if I just control, it'll be all right. I even do that with God. Anybody here? As I was thinking about the woman uh, at Starbucks, uh, this passage of scripture came to my mind, uh, Matthew 6, 25 to 33, a passage that many of you will know well. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store, in, store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't they far more valuable to him? Aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothes, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying what will we eat or what will we drink, what will we wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything that you need. Anybody here know that passage? Anybody here tried to approach that from a, from a pleaser perspective? I feel Okay, God, I just, I just have to, I just trust you and, okay, God, I'm over my control. For me, that leaves me in guilt and shame. Anybody hear that passage and you feel guilty? You feel shame? Because, man, you are not the person that you ought to be. I regularly feel that. You see, one of the problems is this. I don't think Jesus gave us that passage to shame us or to guilt us. I don't think he gave us that passage so that we would focus on what is it that we're focused on. Does that make sense? I think he gave us that passage so that we would focus on the goodness of God. But usually when I read that passage, I think about where is my focus. I think about me. Me. And there is no peace there. As I was talking to my friend, the passage of scripture from John chapter 14, when Jesus is preparing his disciples for his death, came to my mind. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, I would, have, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. A third, a third approach that I come to when I've tried to be a pleaser and I haven't found peace because I can't please everybody, when I've tried to be a controller and I haven't found peace because life is bigger than my ability to control, I usually come to this one. I just won't care. I won't care about anyone or anything. Anybody ever got there? I'm just gonna build walls around my heart and my soul. I am just not, I just am not gonna, I don't, I'm not gonna care about the church. I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm just not, I quit. I'm not caring anyone. And that, I, that way I'll have peace. Because if I don't care, then I can have peace. I've tried. 
But I believe God created me with a heart and a soul that was created in his image. And so I can say that I don't care. But the real truth of the matter is this, I do. And I have to disengage something that's vital in me. And when that gets disengaged, I don't have peace. What I have is death. So what does all this have to do with Christmas? I think we all are looking for peace in a lot of things. And I think Christmas really does matter here and now. Because I think it's the thing that can bring real lasting peace. First of all, I think it brings peace because peace is built upon the promise of God. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, Peter writes this. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed but wants everyone to repent. I don't know about y'all, but that passage, I love and I hate. He's not slow as some people think. He's slow. He's patient. Last week, Pastor Mark talked about that the Christmas story really begins about 2,000 years before the birth of Christ with a man named Abraham who God promised that he would make him a nation and that he would bless all the peoples of the earth. In the book of Matthew, in chapter one, we find a list of the genealogy of Christ that goes from Abraham to to Jesus. And there are 42 generations listed. 42. God is not slow. As some people count slowness. That feels slow, doesn't it? Does the promise of God matter? Does the birth of Christ matter? Does the manger matter? I believe it matters deeply because everything I believe in us, when God is not moving at the speed with which we would like, which in my life has been never, he either moves way slower than I want him to or he moves way faster. He rarely moves at the pace I want. I remember one time I was preaching, I said, I would not want God as a dance partner. And somebody got real offended by it. Because they were like, God has perfect timing. And I'm like, yeah, I know, I don't. And I want to lead. The manger matters. Because in my life, when God is not moving at the pace that I want him to, when when. Everything in my world seems like it's going to chaos and I feel no peace. The manger matters because that reminds me God waited 42 generations to fulfill the promise that he made to Abraham. But he fulfilled it. Who am I to tell him when he's supposed to fulfill his promise to me? even though I do regularly. I gotta be reminded, no, the promises of God are sure and the birth of Christ reveals that we can stand on his promises. He will do what he has told us he will do. The promise of God is sure. If you want to have the peace of Christ, I think it starts by standing on his promises. And the manger matters. Because if there were no Christmas, if there were no birth of his only begotten son, there would be no death. And if there were no death, there would be no forgiveness of sin. And if there were no death, then there could be no resurrection. And if there is no resurrection, then what does it matter? No, it matters completely. 
The problem that I have is I usually disengage the chaos of my life from the promise of God. The manger reminds me, hold on to his promises. The second thing uh, that I believe can give us peace in the midst of chaos is this. His name was to be Emmanuel, which means God with us. In Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, Isaiah writes this. For a child is born to us and a son is given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end, and he will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. One of the things that, that struck me as I was reading that, that passage from Isaiah that, that's quoted in the New Testament is, is if, if you go back and you look at the chapter that Isaiah is writing, that, that prophecy, that promise that, that we hold on to for the birth of Christ, one of the things that, that struck me, and I was looking at a few of the prophecies about the coming of Christ, and almost all of them are wrapped up in prophecies concerning the destruction of Israel. You're going to get conquered. It's going to be bad. Life is going to be hard. But to us, a son is given. And he will be the Prince of Peace, the Almighty Father. the end of his rule, there will, there will be no end to his rule. I don't know about you all, but I need peace when the chaos is there. And I love that Isaiah writes the promise of peace in the midst of what would feel like complete destruction. In my life, one of the things that brings peace is an understanding that God is with us. Emmanuel. God sent his son into our world to bring heaven here, to reveal his kingdom here, that we might have it and have life to the full. He's with us. One of the things that brings peace to me is this, a recognition that I am not alone. And then it is not, life is not dependent on me. One of the things that I thought about after it was too late to get slides in was just having pictures of, of parents holding babies. Because I don't, I don't know about y'all, but when my kids were little, one of my very favorite things to do was to lay on the couch on Sunday afternoons and take a nap with them laying on my chest, napping. Peace. And I fully believe this. One reason that there is so much peace there with that child is because that child knows that you have them. They don't even know what worry is. One of the things that brings me peace is when I have the grace of God in my life enough to become a child and to allow him to have me so that I don't have to. Do you want peace? I believe the manger is the place that you can find it. I think it does matter because it says this, I am with you. I am with you to the place that I will take your sin upon myself and die. I am with you as you face death and as I overcome it that you might have life and have it everlasting. I am with you. Does it even matter? For me, it does. And the last thing that strikes me is if we really want to have the peace of Christ, it comes from submission. Not pleasing 
which typically is almost as much about control as control is. <laughs> I'll just control it by looking like I'm serving. No. Submission is saying, I'm not, you are. Submission is saying, take me, I'm, I'm yours. Submission is recognizing who he is and who we are. Jesus, uh, a passage that, that, that I love that seems like it rarely gets talked about in churches is John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus writes this, I have told you all this so that you, have, so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. In this world, you're going to have many trials and sorrows. I promise, it's going to be painful. But take heart, I have overcome it. Um, God has taught me a great deal about peace uh, over the last 12 years of my life. Um, several years ago, I was on staff at, at a uh, large church in Indianapolis. Um, and uh, I was on staff there for eight years, and, and while I was on staff there, I, I, I kind of started out in adult discipleship, and I ended up being the preaching associate, and over the last uh, three years or so, um, our senior pastor um, went through some trials and, and had a, a long sabbatical, and he came back and was back a year, and then he resigned, um, and during the last three years that I was there, I did about 50% of the preaching, um, <clears throat> and felt like the congregation was really leaning heavily on me um, for, that, for that role. And uh, about six months before my time at East 91st Street came to a close, they hired a new senior pastor. Um, and uh, once he got there, fairly quickly, it was clear that he was going to be making changes in the way we did church. And one of the first ones was, was he let me go. Um, when he let me go, uh, he and our executive pastor told me that it was because I had too much leadership potential for the roles that they would let me play at the church. Um, but apparently I didn't have enough leadership <laughs> potential for the roles that they needed. And so I got fired. And I didn't have much peace. Because I had a house payment that was pretty big. And I didn't know how I was going to make it. My wife worked for a company that um, was struggling, and so sometimes she got paid, sometimes she didn't. Because sometimes they had enough money to make payroll, and sometimes they didn't. And she was part-time anyway, so we were looking at bills, and I was going, Lord, this, we can't have... Anybody? I did not have peace. And when I didn't have peace, what I found that I did have was a good bit of anger. I was angry at the new senior pastor who wasn't around long enough to even find out if I could fit and if I did belong in the plans that he had. He just knew better. I was angry at the leadership of the church because they were glad to lean on me when they needed me, and as soon as they didn't need me, they were glad to let me go. And I was mad. How dare they treat me like that? Anybody been there? And I was not happy with God. Because I had never intended on serving just the church. I was intending to serve him. And he told me that he would take care of everything. Been there? And I lost my job. 
And I didn't know how I was going to make my way. About six months after I was let go from the church, while I was still trying to figure out what was next, I met this guy in Bradenton who hired me to do a job that he could not tell me what it was. Why don't you move to Bradenton and we'll figure it out? Well, I've got no other options right now. Bradenton, here we come. And God worked to fulfill every promise that he ever made me. In ways that I could not understand and could not anticipate. And I can't say that my heart is completely healed from the wounds from the church in Indianapolis. I can say this. They're not what they were. I'm not nearly angry. I can make myself mad because I can always make myself mad. (laughs) But really, I actually spend a lot more time praying for them, for God's blessing on them than I do for God's curses, which is where I started praying. (laughs) Um, And then, a year ago, I got let go from IA because of budget cuts. My role was gone. I didn't know how we were going to live. I still don't. And and I tell you this not because of, man, I'm so faithful or I've grown so much or I've done, I've, I've, no, 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 I tell you this. Because God is God. And he gave me peace in the midst of a storm that I cannot explain and I cannot see through. But he's given me peace Because Jesus was born into the world. The only begotten of God was given to us. He came into our storms. He didn't stay removed from them. He walked in the midst of them on the wind and the waves. And he hung on a cross, a storm that I cannot comprehend. And he won the day by raising from the dead. You see, I have peace in the midst of circumstances that would say you should not, not because of my great faith, but because of my great God. And somewhere in the midst of trials that I would have avoided at all costs, God has revealed himself as the true and faithful living God. Do you want peace? If you want peace, learn the promises of God and stand fully in them. Built upon the promise that he would send his son and that he would bless all the nations of the world. And he fulfilled it 2,000 years after he gave it. Stand firm on the name of Jesus that is Emmanuel, God with us. He's with you. Even when you don't see it. Even when you don't feel it. Find peace by submitting. You are. I'm not. I'm yours. Have your way. I'm not saying it will take away all of the chaos. Jesus promises it won't. But it does promise us this. We can take heart. Take heart. 
He's overcome. And if he has, we will. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much. I thank you for the promises that you have given us. I thank you that, that you have said that we are more important to you than birds or flowers or anything else in creation. And that you fulfilled that promise and you revealed yourself through sending Jesus for us to die that we might be restored to you. Father, thank you for your promises that you have us and that you will provide for us. Father, I thank you so much for sending Jesus to be with us so that he could reveal you in your fullness in our midst. Father, help us to be willing to submit to you that we might be full of you, that we might have peace. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.